Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Richard Wang. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Qberg. And we are developing the next generation of uh, safe and ultra lightweight lithium metal batteries for the future of electric flight. So this is the far future batteries potentially that we might be talking about, but perhaps not quite as far as, um, hopefully not quite as far as some people think. So i uh, give you a little bit of introduction about the, the team and also the company's history, where we came from and where we're at. Uh, so the work uh, for this technology originally came from a material science department at Stanford, where I finished my PhD a couple years ago. Uh, also did, did previously some work on battery research at Tesla Motors, and I did my undergrad at Caltech in mechanical engineering. My co-founder, uh, who's now an advisor for the company, uh, is an active professor in material science at uh, Oxford University um, and provides a lot of scientific input on our technology. Previously, it was a postdoc where we worked together for quite a while at Stanford. Also co-founded another um, grid storage battery company a few years ago. Uh, so the company is, um, has been around since uh, 2015, but we officially spun out of Stanford and started doing this full-time in 2016, so full-time for about two years now. Uh, we've gone through a couple rounds of seed funding, first one with an oil and gas battery manufacturer for some specialty high temperature applications of our technology, but most recently, uh, in January of this year, we closed a new seed funding round led by Boeing Horizon X uh, Venture Group uh, to really look at uh, aerospace uh, applications and especially uh, electric flight applications of our uh, lightweight lithium metal battery technology. Um, have a lot of uh, good mentorship. We're currently based in Berkeley, even though we came from Stanford, uh, because we have an association with uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, through a um, startup accelerator program run by Department of Energy that's called Cyclotron Road. So they've supported us for the past two years with funding, uh, office and lab space, mentorship, and a great uh, network and ecosystem to uh, operate out of. So that's really helped us to accelerate the development, even in this early stage, and actually let us get to uh, a pretty good level of performance and a pretty good maturity of prototypes, even though we've only been around a couple years. Uh, we're graduating from this program now, and pretty soon we'll be moving out into our own uh, office and lab space in Emeryville, uh, still in the East Bay. So um, a lot of people have talked about batteries uh, at the symposium so far, so I think you all know uh, why, why we need better batteries. Uh, lithium ion is perhaps at the cusp of being perhaps good enough for electric flight, but certainly still greatly limiting in terms of the weight and also uh, the safety of the chemistry. Um, so uh, I've, also, I've also seen some of these presentations from Uber. I was at the battery show last year in Michigan where they also presented on Uber Elevate and talked about some of their um, battery requirements. Um, what they're pro projecting for their baseline vehicle is a battery pack at 300 watts per kilogram, which means realistically you're talking about a cell level energy, specific energy of 350 or 400 watts per kilogram easily. And you have to do that while being able to deliver extremely high power and to do all that in a profile that is not sensitive to heat generation and doesn't suffer from thermal runaway and other thermal abuse uh, issues. Uh, because essentially when you're running these um, eVTOL uh, vehicles, for instance, they are uh, extremely aggressive on, on battery operation. And so when people talk about the, you know, the best lithium ion batteries in the, in the world right now, they're maybe at 250 to 270 watt hours per kilogram uh, on the cell level, but those are also cells that are optimized for extremely high energy, and what that means is you're really ramping up the voltage on them, you're using relatively uh, unstable cathode materials, and they're not particularly high power, and they're also sensitive to um, heating, and they also don't have very long cycle life. So a lot of trade-offs to get to that very high energy, and still we're not at the level of, of what, for example, Uber is looking for for a baseline uh, vehicle. Uh, so lithium ion is not quite there, and there's some things on the near horizon that could take it perhaps up to 300, but still with a lot of these performance constraints and especially uh, safety constraints that are, aren't discussed as much uh, by, by the industry. So, so fundamentally, we believe that to really make electric flight uh, a reality, uh, we, we need a new generation uh, of chemistry that is substantially different in terms of performance and in terms of safety. And, and lithium ion, we believe, can take us part of the way there, but probably not to a point where we would be happy with uh, the ultimate performance of these vehicles. So what we're doing is uh, really using um, much more energy dense materials. We use a, a lithium metal battery uh, that's extremely lightweight and ultimately allows us to deliver roughly 80% more energy 
um, on the cell level compared to best lithium ion in the world. So we're talking, uh, today we have 400 watt hours per kilogram in prototypes and within the next year or so anticipating getting to 450 watt hours per kilogram. So substantially more energy per weight compared to lithium ion. And the other key factor we think really is, is the safety profile of the chemistry. Um, for lithium ion, safety already for these high energy batteries is somewhat questionable. Um, but you can kind of engineer your way around that with proper systems. With lithium metal, this is even uh, a greater challenge because lithium metal inherently is less stable of a system. So you really need to get around that by having a fundamentally very safe uh, chemical system that prevents battery fires and, and so forth and, and other reliability challenges with, with high energy batteries. So this is actually a video of a nail puncture test we did uh, about a year ago on one of the early generations of our lithium metal cell. So you'll see um, our cell on top and a commercial high energy lithium ion cell on the bottom. Um, so you can see obviously, you know, pretty severe safety issues with lithium ion. Certainly if you're talking about mechanical abuse and um, the audio is not on here, but uh, basically sounds like a gunshot when it goes off, pretty scary. Um, so this is kind of the worst case that can happen with lithium ion, but even if you're not talking about a nail puncture or mechanical abuse, if you're talking about overheating and short circuiting, these cells can still go into thermal runaway relatively easily, especially when you're, when you're talking about the really high energy stuff that people are putting out these days. So the, what we are doing is really changing the chemistry of the um, lithium ion battery system with new materials um, throughout uh, most of the battery. So it starts with the uh, elect liquid electrolyte inside the battery. Currently, lithium ion uses a mix of organic solvents that's highly flammable. And that actually leads to many of the challenges associated with lithium ion batteries, both in terms of safety, of course, but also in terms of the chemical stability of the system. It, um, prevents us from using better electrode materials that store more energy in lithium ion because the electrolyte itself is not stable enough to um, hold, uh, operate safely and stably with those kinds of uh, energy dense materials. So we start with a new electrolyte and that's really the core of the innovation, a completely different set of uh, solvents and salts that's ultimately extremely thermally stable um, and also chemically stable, which allows us to actually integrate more energy dense components. So starting from that ele new electrolyte, we've then put in a lithium metal anode, which replaces the typical graphite anode in lithium ion batteries with something that's substantially lighter on the anode side, roughly 10 times lighter. So the anode pretty, pretty much disappears from your weight equation. And then on the cathode side, which is um, still the heaviest component of the battery, uh, because of the uh, chemical stability of our electrolyte, we're able to use much more um, aggressive cathode materials that perhaps may not be entirely stable in organic electrolytes, but we can actually cycle these materials at high voltage and get about 30% more energy on the cathode side uh, compared to the best lithium ion in the world without any of the safety or reliability challenges that they run into. So improvements uh, throughout the, the system that let us get to that roughly 80 to 100% improvement on specific energy. And uh, with inherent safety, uh, because of the non-flammable electrolyte that we're using, and then the third key component that I'm gonna talk about now uh, a little later is in terms of manufacturability, uh, which has really been one of the um, key constraints to commercialization for new battery technologies. There's been you know, plenty of um, innovations on the materials world for new battery concepts, but most of them have not made it to market at all. Many of them have failed or they're still in the R&D phase. And, and a key challenge is really scalability and manufacturability. Uh, so on the materials side, we've actually designed everything to be highly scalable, all the materials are procured from um, industrial suppliers that are already produced in the multi-ton scale uh, in the world. And so nothing really very sensitive or difficult to process, but it's really the key chemical formulations in the battery that makes, makes all this possible. So we have uh, two parallel technologies actually. One is a high temperature battery, which I'm not really gonna talk about today too much, but that's what we're doing for that oil and gas partner. Uh, but we have a separate variant of our chemistry that's really optimized for high energy. And this is the one that's more broadly relevant, whether you're talking about electronics or about uh, electric flight. Um, so I'm gonna talk about just a little bit of uh, uh, recent developments and improvements that we've made. Uh, so we're very actively improving the performance of the electrolyte. Uh, recently, uh, especially uh, with recent funding from Boeing, we've really been able to accelerate the pace of our development and also get the performance closer to where we think it's going to be start becoming quite relevant for electric flight uh, applications. So this is just one example of uh, electrolyte improvements compared to what we had at the end of last year and what we're, we did um, in March of this year. You can see for one particular 
um, type of uh, cycling performance, uh, we're getting substantially improved cycle life uh, just with a new electrolyte system and no other tweaks to the, to, to the chemistry. Uh, so substantially improved uh, just in a few months, and this is really not really fully tapped out. We anticipate further improvements as we continue t uh, tuning the electrolyte chemistry. Um, in addition, you can also see, I think perhaps most relevant, is on, on the high power side, which we really need for electric flight. Uh, historically, our chemistry has been somewhat lower power than lithium ion, which has been a downside, certainly, for any aerial application. So a lot of our effort has gone into not only cycle life improvements, but also power improvements. And so if you look at the same electrolytes that I'm showing on cycle life there, you can see um, in the red and the green, and then particularly in April with the purple, you're seeing substantial improvements in power. So this is C rate, which is basically how fast you're um, discharging the battery where C over 20 is a 20 hour discharge, one C is a one hour continuous discharge to full uh, depth of discharge. And you can see for not our most recent electrolyte now, this V2C from April, we're able to do a, a one C discharge still with uh, more than 80% uh, capacity of ethereal capacity. So on the power side, especially given the high specific energy of this chemistry, we already have enough um, continuous power and also pulse power probably for a variety of uh, electric flight applications with this new chemistry. And probably uh, the cycle life is, is starting to get close to where we're, ta we're talking about uh, being commercially viable as well. Uh, so on the performance side, we're happy that um, things are improving and uh, I think pretty soon we'll have something that's gonna be quite relevant for some of these early applications. So uh, on the manufacturing side, um, the other key component, not just of scalability, is not only material scalability, but also manufacturing scalability. A and with respect to manufacturing, we've really designed this to be highly processable with all the existing lithium ion um, equipment that's already out there. A and what's so important about this is it lets us leverage the existing manufacturing ecosystem that's been built up over the past couple decades by the lithium ion battery manufacturers. We don't need to reinvent um, new assembly lines. We can use contract manufacturing and partners to actually do most of the work for us, which allows us to stay much more lean and don't need to raise a huge amount of venture capital to finance this. So this is uh, some shots of some of the processing that we do, uh, all rotor row processes for electrode coatings and slitting. And you actually, actually see the cell winding process with separator, lithium metal, and cathode going in there into the jelly roll. This is in typical 18650 format um, cell that, that we made uh, about a year ago. Electrolyte fill and sealing process all pretty standard and pretty easily scalable um, when you start thinking about actually using this uh, for um, actual, actual practical applications. Um, and so uh, we continue making prototypes. We currently have both cylindrical and pouch cell prototypes, and especially on the pouch cell side, uh, seeing very, very good uh, specific energy and performance out of these cells. Uh, so what, I, I guess what's so important about this manufacturing story, though, is, is not only in terms of just how much money we need to raise, but fundamentally about the kind of um, trajectory and business model that we can have as a battery startup. Um, if, if you know anything about the battery world, it's that in the past 10 years, there have been so many new innovations coming out of universities um, and, and labs, but, and a lot of them have gotten a lot of funding from VCs, but most of them have not been successful. Um, they've taken on the order of seven to 10 years since um, being founded, raised typically on the order from 30 to $100 million, and still most of them are pre-revenue, no major customers, still with pre-commercial prototypes that don't aren't sufficiently um, differentiate it from lithium ion to be commercially interesting yet. And a lot of that is because a lot of these um, new technologies that have been developed are inherently very difficult to scale and to manufacture, which means you need a ton of money just to test out your idea and then you realize that you scaled up, it doesn't work, you have to go back to the drawing board. So we've done something very different where because we're able to test out these prototypes so quickly, uh, it means that we have a much tighter feedback and iteration loop on our R&D. So after only less than a year after you know, actively working on this full time and after, after having spent only about half a million dollars, we were actually able to get to our first prototypes. And those, those first prototypes told us a, a huge amount about what we needed to improve and what we needed to, to um, change in the chemistry. And since then, we've gone through several more rounds of prototyping that have allowed us to actually get this pretty close to um, commercially viable um, format cells with uh, very high performance. We also signed a, a major um, agreement, multi-million dollar agreement with that oil and gas battery customer as our first uh, market, uh, early adopter market, and now we're really looking at some of the other um, uh, coming markets in uh, defense and aerospace especially. 
Um, so starting from kind of the niche high value industries where they don't need a huge amount of performance as long as you can get exactly what they need and they don't care about cost. And then going to the defense, we have um, POs from uh, the Navy and the Air Force currently already for testing samples of our cells and have a lot of potential applications in the defense world that look quite interesting early on. And now we're also starting to put our focus on aerospace, um, obviously a wide variety of applications, um, these high altitude, long endurance pseudo satellites, certainly a possible early application for the technology, but pretty soon we think um, it's gonna start to become viable for um, uh, rotorcraft drones or eVTOL aircraft and so forth. Uh, and then ultimately long term, you know, the, the ultimate target for us is electric vehicles because we still see that probably as being the most uh, relevant uh, large volume market down the road, but um, we're going through the steps to actually get this to market early on rather than only focusing on automotive from the start, which we think is key to helping to actually get this uh, to the market successfully. So uh, I'm going to walk you through kind of how we're going to get there in terms of the, the business model and then also kind of give you an idea of the timeline and where we are today in terms of progress and, and where we're going in the next year or so. So as I mentioned, we start with uh, a very strong supplier network that we've built up over the past couple of years of high quality industrial materials that we can source pretty affordably and scalably already, even as a startup. Uh, we are doing uh, focusing on battery R&D in the past couple of years, and now we've built up really a world-class team and, and uh, facilities to do R&D and have electrolyte uh, and uh, battery formulations that we think are really are pretty cutting edge and uh, unique. Uh, we also have been working the past year with uh, prototyping partners to build pouch cells and cylindrical cells to actually test these in real world conditions. And pretty soon we, we think we'll have um, samples available for testing uh, with customers. So right now um, our estimate is probably in late summer we're going to start testing with a select group of customers in defense and aerospace uh, to start getting evaluations on, on our technology and see how it can fit in with some early applications uh, with these companies. Um, down the road as we scale up, by um, early 2019, we're looking to start going into early uh, contract manufacturing uh, for the first sort of a commercialized generation of our chemistry and looking to start supplying cells on the order of you know, five to 20,000 cells per month kind of quantities in terms of contract manufacturing capacity that our current partner has in-house. And that kind of capacity is going to be uh, sufficient for us to start doing early full systems level testing. If you have an actual aircraft that needs 150 kilowatt hours of batteries, we're going to be able to start supplying potentially that kind of cell quantity in um, early to mid-2019 for testing with early customers. And then as that goes along, then we can continue scaling up further to larger scale manufacturers and to actually go into volume production, uh, production potentially by uh, 2020. St uh, still, still with manufacturing partners. And ultimately, for at least for these early markets, our model is to sell contract manufactured uh, cells to systems integrators in defense and aerospace that will then take our cells, package them into battery packs, and really build them into the aircraft um, and the designs that they need for, for their uh, projects. Um, lo longer term, we do have sort of a, another model, which is more of a licensing approach, um, where this is more relevant for like consumer or automotive applications that are very, very cost driven. And that's where we might con contemplate licensing this out to like a big battery manufacturer to actually scale this up to huge kind of gigafactory scale uh, volumes. But at least in the early stages, uh, we think contract manufacturing is going to take us pretty far for actually supplying a lot of these early uh, markets. Um, so. Uh, we're pretty excited about, about uh, the way that Kubrick is progressing, and we're just you know, dipping our toes now into the electric aircraft world, uh, but certainly see a lot of excitement these days from that area and a lot of demand. So happy to talk more uh, about what we do later on. And also um, tonight I'll also be, I think, uh, hosting the energy-themed dinner. So please come by if you have any questions or want to learn more. Uh, thank you. On one of your graphs, it looked like you were going up to maybe 200 charge cycles. How many charge cycles do you think you're capable of, and do you have problems with things like dendrite growth or you know other failure modes like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, so, so dendrite growth and generally 
the quality of your lithium deposition is always the key challenge for lithium metal batteries. And that's what we're working on with improved generations of our electrolyte as well. Uh, so we currently already have a system that's pretty good at suppressing dendrites, but it's not 100% um, there. So you still get some degradation and side reactions that limit the cycle life currently. So currently, I would say our commercial format cells are on the order of one to 200 cycles. Um, but you know, this has already been improved substantially com even compared to six months ago where the cells were maybe at 30 or 40 cycles. So already maybe a three to five X improvement and we still see a lot of leg, um, um, area for improvement uh, probably in the coming year with improved electrolytes. So I, I would say kind of projecting out to 2019, potentially getting to like the, um, three to 500 cycles in that time frame, And then beyond there, it's a little harder to say. I, I would say the other, I think, noteworthy point is generally for lithium metal chemistries, you are going to have somewhat of a trade-off on cycle life versus uh, uh, energy uh, compared to lithium ion batteries, just because with lithium metal, it's inherently a much more reactive system and you're more prone to uh, degradation. Uh, but if you can get at least get it to a respectable cycle life, then we think it's going to be still very viable for people that are more sensitive on, on weight and other factors compared to a cycle life. It it seems to be an extremely competitive domain that you're working in. And with international competition and everyone striving so hard to rapidly advance this, are you finding that at Kuberg you have to have people working three shifts and staying up <laughs> till 2 a.m. and all that sort of thing? I mean, is it is it that driven? Um, the, the, there is a lot of competition, um, but but at the same time, it's interesting because as I mentioned, there have been so many companies that have tried, but if you just look at the history, none of them have succeeded so far. And, and so we actually see competition not as being our, our biggest threat, at least from other startups. We really see the biggest form of competition really as being the incumbent lithium ion players, the LG Chems and Panasonics of the world with their continued incremental improvements to lithium ion because they have so much manufacturing capacity and scale and cost advantages that lithium ion is still the predominant technology to beat for us. Um, so. We, we don't quite do three, three shifts a day, but uh, we, we do work very, try to work extremely efficiently with, with, a, with a small team and s small amount of resources. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, I keep reading a lot of technology coming out of MIT and they're always talking about graphene. Mm. What's up with graphene? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question. It's, it's, a, it's very much a, a very high, I would say hyped up uh, technology in the battery world. Um, it, it does have its uses, but perhaps not quite as remarkable as people are imagining. So right now, the, the most interesting use case for graphene is as a, essentially like a conductive additive uh, to improve the electronic conductivity of your electrode materials. And what, why that's important is ultimately the electronic pathways created by graphene are much more conductive than the current types of synthetic graphite they use as additives. And so with lowered electronic resistance, you can charge and discharge your batteries much faster without as much internal heating as you otherwise would get. So there are some benefits on faster charge discharge, but, but that's the, the main advantage. You're not getting these you know, crazy increases in capacity and so forth that other people are talking about. A lot of that is really not scaled up. So in terms of practical use, it's mainly as a better conductive additive to get better power. Thank you.